Hello, welcome to our channel at BTG Actualidades. Uh, we're here to discuss the, the Colombian outlook after the recent elections, uh, which, uh, of course, we all know uh, elected Gustavo Petro, uh, the first leftist uh, president of Colombia. Uh, it's a pleasure to have here with us uh, two uh, Colombians, specialists from the BTG Pactual. We have uh, Munir Halil. Uh, he's uh, the chief economist for Colombia at BTG Pactual. And also we have uh, here Daniel, Daniel Guardiola. He's the head of Colombian equity research uh, at BTG Pactual. So welcome uh, you both. Uh, we're going to do this uh, in English. There's a translation for, for Portuguese. Uh, I'd like to start just uh, with a thought uh, on, on politics itself. I mean, uh, it's the first, as I mentioned, it's the first uh, um, leftist president elected in Colombia. We have uh, a number of uh, leftist uh, uh, presidents being elected across the region. Uh, is, what do you think was the, the main theme uh, of this election and why this, this uh, outcome, which is the first uh, from, from the Colombian history? Uh, where, where do you pin uh, this, this elections in terms of themes and, and uh, what moved the electorate on this? So I, I uh, think de definitely, Joao, what, what, I, what, what I would say is that there was a combination of factors. The first one that we can point has to do with the fact that uh, the overall sense that we observed throughout the region and all this electoral process uh, were just against the the government that was in charge of the pandemic there was like a general uh, sense of main street in this case colombians who were not happy with what was happening with the current government and that had a lot to do so any candidate who was up to some extent associated with the incumbent administration immediately got uh, uh, affected by that by that, 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 that link that's the kind of the first thing the second thing in terms of the proposals uh, per se that we observed of now president-elect Gustavo Petro has to do with the fact that he sold, he sold himself as an anti-establishment anti guy, uh, a person basically that was uh, trying to sell change, that things were going to be definitely different under, his, under the helm of, of this leftist administration. And at the same time, he sold an idea of future that was extremely appealing to youngsters, to people who is very, at, the, at this very beginning, uh, starting in the political decision process, which was just this idea of a transition in energy, the idea of turning Colombia into like a, a power of an alternative electricity and energy generation uh, that really bode very well in terms of this young population. When we see specifically who voted for Petro, we are going to find that uh, most of his electorate is people who is relatively young. And that, that when you begin to see the increases in population on the different uh, ranges of ages, you also found, you're going to find basically that uh, it was more difficult for him to gain voters against those who were there when, for example, back in the 80s, he was still a member of the leftist uh, and guerrilla group, M M19, for example. Okay. Daniel, would like to yeah, I mean, add something? No, I agree with Monir. I mean, I think the pandemic played a, a, a very significant role because even though we have seen a very, very strong recovery in the common economy, there are still some metrics that are still above pre-pandemic levels, such as unemployment. So unemployment is still very high, double digits. Uh, inflation, you know, is a global phenomenon, is uh, is extremely high. And I think those factors are also negatively affecting the well-being perception of Colombians. So they got the feeling that because of the pandemic and because of the way the current government managed the pandemic, and this is something that will apply everywhere, uh, is it is necessary, you know, to change. And the reality is that the two guys that were competing in the runoff, they were outsiders. I mean, they didn't belong to any traditional party. I mean, Raul Fernandez was someone that here in Colombia three months ago, no one knew about him. He was totally an unknown guy. Uh, and Petro, uh, he has been in the opposition for the last 20 years. So I think that's also something that I will highlight, you know, the, the effects of the pandemic. Okay, okay. Um... 
I think it would be very useful to, to those who are uh, looking at uh, this material um, for you to, to for you guys to describe a little bit who is Gustavo Petras, what's his history, what's his background, uh, experience. Uh, so uh, for us to try to project what is to come from what uh, he has been so far. Yes, I think, uh, well, Gustavo Petro definitely is a figure, uh, one of the most important leftist figures uh, in, in the political spectrum in Colombia. He has more than 20 years of experience in Congress. At the same time, uh, he already had uh, the second most important uh, position by uh, votes that you can get in Colombia, which is he was mayor of Bogota. Uh, and uh, even previous to that, of course, prior to his political life, he was a member of this a guerrilla group that was called M19, which is basically uh, was uh, something that got one the first major uh, guerrilla group that got into some peace uh, negotiations. And that uh, as a consequence of that, uh, they were successfully uh, dismantled at the end of the 80s, uh, beginning of the 90s. So this is a person, Gustavo Petro, who, who is really prepared, who has prepared. This is the third time that he's actually running for president. Uh, so it's, it applies that this is the third time it's he has been senator as he has a very brief uh, passage through the lower house uh, but most of his uh, political life has been in, in the Senate where he just has uh, uh, is very famous for being one of the most critical and opposition leaders uh, until now which now he became the president and he will have the opposition those who, who, who were in the previous in power. It's, 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 that has been the type of transition that we were moving into. Okay. And in terms of uh, his background, in terms of, uh, uh, I mean, making deals with uh, op opposition uh, uh, actors and, and negotiation, uh, would you say he has a strong background on that? Because, I mean, these are of when... course very valuable characteristics for a politician in charge. Sure, Joao. We will have to uh, head back to, to go back to the, the moment in which Gustavo Petro was major of Bogota. And at that time, basically, he didn't have a majority in the municipal council. So several of the things that needed to be approved, uh, of course, needed some sort of consensus. There were moments of fights. There were moments in which those consensus were reached. And I think that in this case, he has begun the presidency with this call for what we call it like a, a national consensus. He's trying to build this national consensus. He has been calling every single political party, even the ones on the opposition, which are just the one of the democratic center political party, Centro Democratico, uh, which uh, the, the leader of that coalition is former president Alvaro Uribe, uh, has already even accepted to meet with Gustavo Petro. And uh, we also know of the upcoming president of Congress, which is Roy Barreras, which is right now the right hand of Gustavo Petro in the political ground, uh, has been meeting with every single politician and every single congressman in order to try to reach and to try to bring them into this, uh, what they call this national coalition. The idea is to have uh, within the first hundred days of government, a set of reforms approved. On the, uh, and we will talk later about specifically what that type of reforms are. But definitely what we have then is, is, is a a politician that has enough experience and that has been trying to reach this agreement. One of the main questions that we will ask going forward is for how long this coalition can last. As usual, there, this is, there are several political parties of different orientations which will, will end up being part of this coalition. And hence, I find it extremely difficult that this coalition will sustain the, the length of time necessary. Maybe they are able to approve some of the reforms, but uh, I think that uh, decision and discussions among this so diversified portfolio of political parties is inevitable as, as of now. Oh, excellent. Uh, one thing uh, would, it would be very important for us to discuss, of course, is, is the content of the reforms that Petro uh, is, is uh, proposing for, for the country. Of course, we have the, the tax reform, we have the pension reform. Uh, and, and all the reforms that have to do with the oil and gas sector. So uh, maybe you could start with the oil and gas. Uh, I mean, uh, what is exactly that he's proposing and what are the implications for, for the sector? It's a very important sector for, for the economy. Maybe uh, we could start with, uh, again, uh, uh, Munir. 
uh, des describing the importance of this sector, both in terms of GDP, investment, foreign direct investment uh, for the economy, uh, and then turn for you, uh, Daniel, to, to discuss a little bit more the implications for the sector itself for Ecopetrol. In general, I think uh, definitely the, the, the main changes that are, have been proposed are not necessarily part of what I will call a reform, is, uh, which is unfortunate because it will be nice if we have to have reform, it will have to be taken to Congress. But the changes that Gustavo Petro is proposing are not necessarily things that will need Congress to be achieved. Uh, Daniel will tell you just a second exactly what are the type of things that he could do regarding Ecopetrol. But definitely from a macro perspective, we're talking that, that uh, um, oil and mining, specifically oil, represents roughly 3% of GDP. So we, we cannot call ourselves a, a, an oil economy. But at the same time, it's a significant source, a combination basically of, of, of between oil and coal, for example, is representing roughly half of the country's exports. So it's a very significant source of US dollars for a country that is has, uh, I always call it the Achilles heel of the Colombian economy, has to do with this current account deficit, which as of last quarter is at 6.4% of GDP. Hence, we definitely need the US dollars. Uh, the sector also represents a significant source of, of, of revenues for the government and for the management, of, for the financing of the budget. So the change that Gustavo Petro is asking for is just a transition. It's something that he has been calling a transition in the sense that he wants to change from this energy uh, associated to fossil fuels to an energy that is more uh, for a renewable sources of energy. And uh, in that order of ideas, this is a main difference with other uh, uh, postures and uh, uh, points of view that we have observed throughout the region, uh, because he definitely wants, and he has been talking about changing Colombia in terms of, of turning into a, a superpower in terms of energy, renewable energy for the country. Uh, that is interesting given the fact that most of the energy produced in Colombia uh, is, is very green in the sense that it comes from hydro sources. That does not necessarily means that we are really in, in, in with our current business in the kind of polluting on a significant way uh, to the environment. But he has been very clear about that. And a lot of people has uh, bought this idea that we need this transition. I mean, I, I will add, you know, you know something to what Munir said uh, regarding how important is the oil and gas industry for Colombia, is that it not only contributes to exports, 40% of exports, fiscal income, roughly 10 to 15% of total fiscal income, but also FDI, direct investments. If you look at the average that this industry has accounted in terms of FDI during the last five, 10 years, it's something close to 30%. So 30% of total FDI that Colombia receives every single year is related to oil and gas. So it's a, it's a very important sector for Colombia, especially right now that we're living at bonanza of oil prices. And it's, it's exotic to see, you know, that the elected president, he wants to gradually dismantle the sector. His economic advisors have announced that they are planning to dismantle the sector in the next 15 years and to speed up the, the energy transition that Colombia is already doing. I mean, if you look at the last conference of the parties at Glasgow, the COP26, Colombia engaged to reduce by half its carbon emissions by 2030 and to become net zero by 2050. Uh, one of the main pillars behind that is the Colombian NOC, which is Ecopetrol. Ecopetrol right now, it was the first Latin American NOC to engage or to commit to cut by half its carbon emissions in, by 2030 and to become net zero by 2050, something similar to what you know other global players have been doing, have been announcing, especially in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very exotic, but it's still, you know, that's the campaign. That's what he promised in campaign. We'll see, you know, if he changes. But he promised, he basically mentioned that he wanted to halt exploratory activities in Colombia, exploration. But he didn't provide any details on that. He didn't say how. And the details are very important, you know? The mm -hmm. devil is in the details, actually. 
uh, because if he decides just to stop uh, awarding or stop doing bidding rounds and awarding exploratory acres, that's okay. That's okay. Nothing's going to happen. If you look at the major or the main oil and gas operators in Colombia, they already have an inventory big enough to support approximately 10 to 15 years of exploration in Colombia. Now, the issue is if Gustavo Petro's administration decides to basically make life more difficult for oil and gas operators in terms of securing environmental licenses, in terms of securing the social license that is much needed to operate, mm -hmm. uh, he could basically, without the need of congressional support, he could make life of these operators way more difficult. And that's for the entire sector. But also keep in mind that the NOC in Colombia uh, basically produces 70% of the entire oil and gas that Colombia produces, which is Ecopetrol. And the owner of the NOC, or the largest shareholder of Ecopetrol, is the Colombian government. The Colombian government has 88.5% of this company. So if Gustavo Petro wants to speed up the energy transition, I think it is, it is something uh, likely to believe that he's going to try to use Ecopetrol to speed up that transition. But the reality you are right now is that uh, announcements, there are not many. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a lot of uncertainty in the sector. Uh, we just know that they have announced that they want to halt exploration, but we don't have any details. And that they want to, you know, speed up this energy transition and dismantle it in the next 15 years. Uh, but as I told you, you know, the devil is in the details and we don't know them yet. Yeah, I know, I know. And, and dismantle is, of course, a very strong word, but, word, but uh, let's see how exactly they put in practice, uh, as you said. Uh, one thing uh, that uh, relates to this is, of course, uh, the, the tax reform. I mean, he's, he's proposing a tax reform. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, he's proposing to increase the tax take by about 5% of GDP. And uh, maybe you guys could discuss uh, what uh, details do we have and what we don't have, uh, both in terms of what is, is he seeking, but also the, the uh, economic implications more broadly and the, the sector implication that might come out of this, this uh, proposed reform. Sure, uh, effectively, as, as, as you said, uh, Joao, what we have is a tax reform that the aim is to reach around 50, a little bit over 50 trillion pesos, which represents uh, roughly 5% of GDP. The main idea this administration has is that it wants to change the way taxes are collected in Colombia. Currently, roughly between 70 to 80 percent of income tax comes from corporations in Colombia. The rest comes from personal, for individuals, for individuals. So basically, uh, what they want is to switch uh, to and to basically increase the amount of taxes that are paid by individuals, and specifically, of course, not lower or medium income individuals, but rather uh, high income individuals. So the main goal that they have under this new uh, tax reform will be to try to uh, better consider the type of revenues, which so far in the Colombia under the tax code, they are differentiated. One thing is you get salaries, one thing is you get capital gains. And the idea is to say that income is income and that whatever comes to you as a, as a person you have to pay taxes just like anybody else. It doesn't matter if it is salary, it doesn't matter if it comes from capital, it's just, uh, it's just typical income. So that's kind of the first main change that they will attempt to do. They have also uh, detected and uh, the main economic advisor of, of, of President-elect Petro, which is Ricardo Bonilla, has been saying repeatedly that uh, they have uh, this idea in which some corporations in Colombia uh, in order for the owners to not appear owning a lot of goods, normally they register the goods and, and, and some of the assets they have uh, in the corporations that they own. So the company has uh, the typical thing, the building where they work, the offices where they work, the chairs, the cars, whatever, but it also has the apartment where the owner lives. It also has the car. With, and, and, and basically, that they say is that that is unfair because that reduces 
the tax burden for those, the owners basically of this company. So what they want is to change basically to a system in which they're able to separate that from corporations. Uh, and if that is achieved, what they have said is also that they would like to reduce corporate taxes. As you know, or if but the, the, audience, the audience maybe doesn't, is that we have one of the highest, if not the highest corporate tax rates in Latin America at 35%. Uh, so the idea basically is to, to try to reduce that. They say that they will be able to do that as long as, as we are able to see uh, these improvements in tax collection stemming from, from individuals. Uh, then the other big part of this $50 trillion tax reform has to do with exemptions. The tax code in Colombia uh, is a combination of several tax reforms that we had. I mean, in Colombia, we had over the past 20 years, at least more than 14, 15 tax reforms. So every two years we, we have a tax reform. And that has led to a tax code that is just, uh, has a lot of exemptions. Every tax reform gets one new form of tax exemptions. So what the government wants is to try to reduce that. The, that being said, it makes a lot of sense. I think uh, this is not something that we have heard from, from from new, this is not something that we are discovering right now. This is something that has been diagnosed by several uh, uh, institutions and previous government. The problem is always trying to achieve a change into these exemptions because the moment they touch it, the moment they're going to be lobbyists in Congress who are going to be against it and they will make all the fight in Congress to try to keep it. They will sell those exemptions as absolutely important for the continuation and the development of the sector. And that is kind of the main fight that I, I, I basically foresee that uh, the new administration will have to give in Congress in order to reduce these exemptions. And to be sincere, out of the 50 trillion pesos worth of this tax reform, I will say most of it, at least 40, are tied to this elimination of these exemptions. So, so it's, it's a challenging environment because they're going to have to, I'm quite sure they're not going to be able to go over 100% of the exemptions that they want to get rid of. And uh, there are going to be some of, of those who will definitely will have to stick. Right. Yeah, right. Daniel, uh, could you comment yeah. uh, not only on the sector implications, uh, if uh, you have any clarity on that, but could they use eventually even the, this tax reform to try to achieve goals such as the, the ones we just mentioned in the oil and gas sector? I mean, they could use the tax reform to eventually increase taxation on the sector, which is something that the candidate Petro mentioned at the time. He mentioned that he wanted the sector to have a bigger contribution to society. Uh, they could use also, you know, the tax reform to increase royalties. So that could also happen. I just wanted to add to what Munir was saying is that uh, it sounds very interesting, you know, when they talk about reducing corporate income taxes, uh, but it's, it's, it's very unlikely, honestly. It's very difficult. This is the low hanging fruit in Colombia. If you look at the last or the past six tax reforms, in most of them, the focus of the reform has been on how to increase taxation on corporates. Because it's easy to collect. I mean, when you're increasing taxation on individuals, it is way more difficult to collect it. And maybe the fiscal impact is lower. As Munir, as Munir said, it, you know, the bulk of the expected collection of this tax reform that Petro is proposing comes from eliminating tax exemptions. The other portion, which is increased taxes on wealthy individuals, increasing taxes on what they call high earners, increasing taxes on dividends, is, is very marginal, honestly. So, so we'll see, we'll see what happens at the end of the day. I mean, he has right now a strong coalition in Congress, but I don't think that the current coalition is giving Petro uh, a blanket check. It's not a blank check. I think, you know, the parties that recently incorporated this coalition are going to play the role of moderating the reform and making sure, you know, that yes, collection increases, but it doesn't derail economic growth in Colombia. Perfect. Um, and, and just to, to try to uh, exhaust this, this issue of uh, reforms, let's talk a little bit about the, the social security reform. I mean, uh, what exactly is he proposing and what are the implications, including for, for the Colombian uh, capital markets going forward? 
Sure. Uh, definitely one of the main uh, proposals that they are trying to do is this, what we call here the pension uh, reform. We have a very a pension fund system that has a lot of problems and that definitely needs change. I mean, that is something that has been diagnosed already many years ago and that has produced several alternatives. I mean, since I can recall, I will say at least seven years ago, back in 2015, we heard the first recommendation from the World Bank as to what changes could be done to the pension fund system. We have a pension fund system that these days guarantees that one out of four Colombians would get a pension. So it's a very low, uh, coverage in terms of, of the access that people will get basically to the to the pension fund. And in that order of ideas, what we have then is, is, is a situation in which also the way this is a structure provides a massive subsidy to wealthy individuals with the highest branches of salaries in the country. And the reason why that is the case is because we have right now, the way the system works right now, is uh, has two parallel uh, pension fund systems. On one side, we have the public pay as you go, and on the other side, we have private individual accounts in which you basically make on a monthly uh, withdrawals and basically you, you you put some money basically there in those pension funds. Uh, it turns out that the rules in which you end up uh, retiring under the pay as you go system, the public system, guarantee a higher pension that if you stay on the private fund. So what we have seen over the years is that there is a massive, massive change from those, specifically from those high earners, which have already very high probability of actually retiring, uh, who have moved from the private sex pension funds towards the public pension system. And uh, that has created basically a massive, massive amount of, of subsidies which need to be provided for the government because those individuals never were, they were never able to save the amount of money that they're required in order to make, uh, to get the, the payments on the retirement that they're actually getting. Um, that is unfair, that needs to be changed, that needs to be stopped. So what is proposed basically for the government is the fact that uh, we, for this new government has to do with the fact of, of having a multi-pillar a kind of system, one in which you will have like a social security, basic social security network in which if you were able to save it all for a pension, it doesn't matter, you will get a pension. That's kind of the first thing. And it's gonna be roughly half a minimum wage, which in Colombia these days and at the current exchange rate is roughly $220 more or less. So you will get $110 worth of, 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 of uh, of uh, the equivalent of $110 basically as a pension, even if you didn't save at all for the, for the, for the system. Then uh, if you're working and you're currently working and between one in four minimum wages, that is the, the salary range that they're stipulated and considering, you will make the contributions to, to the public system, the public system. Even if you have higher uh, levels of revenues, the first, the equivalent of your first four minimum wages you will make to the public, to the public system. And then tied to that, the, the excedent, what is in excess of that, you will send finally to the private administrators. Uh, so that's kind of the proposal. The main problem that we have in Colombia tied to that is whether if we stick with this idea of four, the equivalent of four minimum wages, roughly 95% of the current population earns four minimum wages or less. So most of the monthly contributions that are being done towards the uh, private pension funds these days will move from the private pension funds to the public one reducing the ability of the private pension funds and reducing the source of the highest portion of uh, macroeconomic savings that we have in the economy with consequences also in terms of the development of the capital markets. Uh, because as you know, pension funds locally uh, are the biggest players in terms of institutional players. I mean, in terms of, of the bond market, the local bond market, in terms of the stock market as well. Uh, and, and that is one of the main concerns that has been raised associated to this proposal of a pension fund. Yeah, Munir described the reform very well. 
but I think there's a, a major implication of the reform as it is. And it's not only that they're gonna be less active, you know, the pension funds uh, in the local equity market or the local bonds market. No, is that the sustainability of the pension funds of the private pension funds in Colombia is gonna be at risk. And it's gonna be at risk because right now, the remuneration of the pension funds comes from a commission income. And that commission is basically paid on the new contributions, not on AUMs. So if contributions decline by 90% or 95%, what we're gonna see is that the revenues of the private pension funds are gonna decline basically by 90%, by 95%. So it's gonna be impossible to maintain that system as it is. So it's, it's, it could really put at risk the, the, the sustainability of the system as we know it today. Uh, and that would be very bad, you know, uh, for Colombia in terms, of, uh, in terms of the development of capital markets and in terms of actually increasing or building up a robust amount of savings, which is something that we have been doing for the last 30 years. So once again, I don't know how many of you agree with me here, but I think, you know, this is the, the, the reform that was promised in the campaign. And at the end of the day, I think we're gonna see something very likely, even though, you know, we have been discussing this for the last eight, seven years. And I haven't seen a, a president uh, brave enough to introduce a reform like this to Congress, but let's imagine he does. Uh, we're gonna see a watered down version, very likely. I think. What do you think, Monir? Absolutely. I think definitely there will be a watered down version of this pension fund reform, specifically on the amount of, of salaries that can actually have to do this, this sending their money towards the, the, the public pension fund. I'm quite sure that we at least we will have between one or two minimum wages, but the four maybe is too much. Yes. Okay. And this new system would be a pay as you go. Actually, I both. think that the, there will be a combination of both, but the reality is that most of the flows, yes, most of the flows of the new flows of wages will go towards the public fund and only a small portion will end up uh, in, in the hands of those private administrators. Yes. Right. I, I just wanted to up our emphasis here and is that a couple of years ago, I remember in Mexico, uh, it was the same situation pension reform from AMLO is going to destroy the private pension fund system over there. And you know what? At the end of the day, it ended up enhancing the private pension fund system because what it did is that basically it increased the monthly contributions. Uh, just to close the parenthesis, I mean, I'm just saying this because one thing is a campaign and a different thing, you know, very different thing is the, is the, is the, is the real lives, real politics. Right, right. No, I think you're absolutely right. And uh, we are in the early days of this transition. So a lot will, will take place in the coming months. Uh, uh, Daniel, uh, could you uh, maybe describe a little bit in more detail the, the sector implications of what's in, in the table right now? Uh, do, you, do you see winners and losers? Uh, losers, I think we have already identified at least one. But and the market as well, you know, <laughs> the market identified the oil and gas industry as a potential loser, you know, that's why the uh, the share price of a cup of petrol is down, I don't know, 25% or something like that since Petro got elected. Uh, and also, you know, the 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 price of the, the share price of the other oil and gas operators in Colombia is down. So that sector, of course, it seems like a loser today. Uh, uh, I think that the banking sector could also be uh, uh, will be negatively affected, I would say. We could expect uh, more regulation. We could expect, you know, uh, petrol administration without the need to have congressional support to, I don't know, try to reduce the cap rates, try to direct lending, uh, increase competition against private banks from the state-owned banks and, and that kind of things. I think that's something we could expect. Uh, also, we could expect more taxation. I mean, in Colombia, it became a tradition, you know, to create a surcharge tax on banks. So every time there's tax reform, even from center right and right wing parties, every time there's a tax reform, if they don't, if they, if the, if the math doesn't add up, 
they ended up doing a tax surcharge on banks. Mm -hmm. So that's something that could happen as well. Um, I will say that a sector that in theory should benefit are utilities focused on uh, unconventional uh, renewable energy generation. Okay. So today that sector, I mean, if you look at the total matrix of Colombia, unconventional renewable generation accounts for roughly 10% of total installed capacity. Uh, so I think, you know, if Petro is consistent with his environmental speech, you know, to speed up the energy transition, we could, we could expect uh, that sector uh, being a net winner, you know. One thing that, that I think uh, definitely in Colombia, we're going to be needing a lot of the experience that uh, you in Brazil guys have has to do with this development of of these uh, state-owned institutions to try financial institutions such as the BNDS, the Bandes in the case of Brazil. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that I'm quite sure this administration will try to attempt is to create the equivalent of a BNDS in Colombia. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, that has some positive things, but at the same time, when I talked to the specialists in the sector in Brazil, also created a lot of damage when it was being developed. So, so definitely, we need to look back at the experience that you already lived through, and actually try to approach at some point the government to show them exactly what what's the right uh, size of 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 of, of, of what this state-owned institution should be, because uh, for what we have heard regarding that they really want a large, massive, sustainable financial institution. And we learn from your experience uh, that that is not necessarily what a country ends up needing. Yeah, yeah. And guys, uh, I mean, you already have touched uh, on this, but uh, I mean, how much moderation can you expect from Congress and other institutions in, in Colombia to this, to this agenda? And uh, uh, it would be maybe useful for us to walk to, to AUKUS, AUKUS uh, on the um, issue of how to form a coalition, what are the bases for this, is it power sharing, is it more a programmatic coalition, how, how does political uh, bargaining takes place in Colombia on that front? Regarding Congress, but what I could say definitely is that we have seen very much aligned to what is happening everywhere, that we went from a type of typical bipartisan arrangement towards a multi-party system. Uh, just in the latest uh, Congress elections, we ended up having twin, at least 21 political parties have representation. So, of course, the largest one these days is, is, a, is a Pacto Historico, which is basically the political party of the current president, uh, elected president, uh, Gustavo Petro, and uh, but it's not a majority. They basically have no majority. So. What they have been trying to do and they're currently doing is trying to talk with some of several of these phrases. Some of them includes the traditional parties such as the liberal party. Uh, but at the same time, they're also talking to another leftist oriented parties uh, as well as some other more center right like Cambio Radical. Uh, so, so in that order of ideas, they have this idea that they want to share power. We also heard the upcoming uh, new president of Congress, which is going to be Roy Barreras, uh, talking about the fact that they want to share power, that they definitely, if these political parties want to join the, to join the government, they will allow them to hold positions, uh, political positions, so maybe some ministries will go to them. And uh, that is positive in the sense that that's a typical way and you're actually able to ar arrive to consensus. As we discussed previously, I also believe that this leads to moderation because the only way in which these other political parties will be, will we feel comfortable joining uh, a, a leftist uh, political party is towards moderation. There's no other way uh, that, mo that going into moderation that you could get that type of of announcement. So the problem then is that there's so many of them that again, trying to hold that uh, and, and from so much the, the diversity in terms of the ideologies and the political orientation of each one of these parties. But trying to, I mean, I think it will be extremely optimistic to say that this coalition is going to last throughout the four years of mm -hmm. President Petro administration. So there will be more uh, the situations in which there are discussions and maybe some differences, but the ones in which they're going to be able to arrive to, to some form of, of consensus, I will say. 
right? And Petro is, is coming from what, uh, 26, 27 percent of uh, Congress, right? In terms of his own party representation. And uh, most of these reforms we're talking about would need what, simple majority? Yes, they need 50. Roughly out of the 108 uh, senators that we currently have in the upper house is 55. And when you're thinking of the lower house, they will need roughly 80 representatives. So that's that's what they, they, they will need in order to get those approved. Okay. Daniel? No, I, I was going to say, you know, that beyond Congress, when, when I talk to investors about the potential checks and balances, yes, of course, Congress is going to play a, a very significant role. And, uh, you know, the silver lining that I'm seeing from this political coalition that was endorsed by the Liberal Party is that they're going to draw a red line, you know, saying, yes, we're going to support the reforms of the incoming administration, but they're going to moderate some of these reforms. Mm -hmm. But another checks and balances that we haven't talked about is are the courts. I think the courts are going to play a very significant role here, trying to limit some of the radical proposals or radical measures that the incoming administration may try to implement. I think that that's a very important point. Uh, finally, guys, uh, I mean, do we have uh, already a sense of uh, a list of names that uh, could uh, take important positions, so, such as the finance ministry or or the, the uh, oil and gas, I mean, the energy and mining uh, ministry? In the case of, of the Minister of Finance, which is, I believe is kind of the most expected uh, announcement that we had so far this week, and it, it didn't come. Uh, basically, what we have heard is that there is a, an interesting spectrum of names that go from very academic and recognized individuals such as Jose Antonio Campo. He already was uh, um, a minister of finance back in the 90s and the most recent position he held was a board member of the central bank in colombia he's currently a professor at the university of colombia in new york uh, there has been also some names that have popped out uh, which includes uh, very experienced politicians such as cecilia lopez a very technical individuals such as, as carolina uh, basically, uh, which is, is, is in charge of, of, she was basically also a board member uh, of, the, of the central bank previously to hold this position. And at the same time, there has been names such as Alejandro Gaviria, which was a former minister of health and also an economist who was uh, the dean and uh, for the president of the University of Los Andes, which is the biggest private university uh, in Colombia. So we had a, a plethora, basically, of names that have been uh, mentioned. However, uh, the fact that uh, so far we don't have the name means that uh, they are in this process of discussing uh, exactly what is going to happen. The bad news is that President-elect uh, Petro decided to take some days off uh, and currently is, is on vacations. So uh, unless he decides basically to stop the vacation to make the announcements of the new Minister of Finance, that will be extremely welcoming set of news. Uh, we will have to wait until his return in order to, to hear exactly what's going to be happening. Okay. I, I, I was going to say that, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, of course, the spotlight is in the Minister of Finance. Uh, but I think, you know, something very important as well is going to be who's going to be the Minister of Energy. It's going to be the Minister of Environmental Affairs, because, I mean, those two ministers who really make life easier or more difficult for oil and gas operators, for mining companies, for generation companies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, we have we don't have a short list as extensive as the one that Munir just said regarding the Minister of Finance. Sure. And so far, I have only heard of one individual that could be, you know, the potential minister of energy, uh, which seems okay. He was the former CEO of GB, Grupo Energia Boca, and former CEO of TGI, which is the largest gas transportation company in Colombia. So if he is the guy that eventually will be appointed as minister of energy, I think he is a very moderate person, very moderate person that understands how important the sector is for Colombia. But still, we don't have a such an extensive short list, as Munir said, elected President Petro decided to take a few days off 
uh, and travel to Europe, you know, to relax after an intensive campaign. Excellent. Well, I have said that, that was the, the last one, but uh, then I'm going to make the, the, the very last one, guys. Uh, uh, how do you see international relations of Colombia uh, going forward? What changes in the relations with the US, Venezuela, the rest of Latin America, including Brazil? Oh, definitely what, what we're going to have is some, some major changes in terms of the relationship. You know that Colombia has always been considered by the United States as one of the most important allies in the region. The idea, I think, from the parties to try to consider that, but definitely I see that under President-elect Gustavo Petro, what we will have is a reopening of the commercial ties that the country used to have with Venezuela. That doesn't mean immediately that there's going to be a windfall because of that. Because remember, Venezuela is a country that has been reduced significantly the amount of GDP and the, the amount of revenues that they currently have. But he will try to open up uh, trade relationships again uh, with, with Venezuela. He will try to approach, of course, all the leftist governments in the region, so Chile, Argentina, and of course, it will be very much in touch with what happens in Brazil in order to determine if there is a finally winning of Lula. Of course, the, the ties there are quite, it will be more easier for Gustavo Petro to have, to have strength, uh, strengthening the relationship with the Brazilian government that if it's the case of a continuation of, of President Jair Bolsonaro. So, so in, in that order, if I, Anna, of course, Mexico, of course, that's another one. So there is uh, an increasing amount of, of leftist governments of which Gustavo Petro has already said that he wants to join and he wants to share ideas. And uh, so that type of, of things we will see. And uh, maybe connecting with the previous questions, it's going to be extremely important who the Minister of Exterior Relationships is going to be, because at the end of the day, uh, and the Minister of Trade, because those guys will be in charge of something that has been said as well, which is the country is attempting to increase tariffs in some of the goods in order to protect local industries and to increase the production of local uh, products in Colombia. So that, of course, is going to lead, given the fact that we already signed several free trade agreements with many economies, that's going to lead to some trouble, depending on the, uh, the region in which these goods are going to be coming. And an imposition of tariffs is not something that was in the idea of signing these free trade agreements. So we're going to have to have some discussions on that. And the person who is appointed there will have to try to, to have that discussions. The government has already said, the new government, that basically what they want to have is, uh, is, is something that is not unilateral, that if any decision regarding these tariffs is reached, it will have to imply the counterpart. They will definitely have to discuss about it. Uh, but uh, it's already there, and we have to wait and see exactly how this ends up being implemented. And just to wrap it up, I will say, you know, that Right now, the ties between Colombia and China are, are not big. So maybe, you know, uh, one change in the international relationships will be that Petro will try to, to get closer to China. I think that's something that we could maybe expect, you know, from this administration. But we'll see, you know, he hasn't really talked, he hasn't talked a lot about this, you know. The main focus, you know, international relationships has been on Venezuela, I would say. I think this is a very valid point, and of course, China is very probably keen to to uh, get closer to to Colombia, very important commodity producer. So, yeah, uh, very important to to take into this, this into account. So, guys, uh, I would like to thank you very much, Daniel, uh, Munir. Uh, we think I think uh, in a couple months we have to to do another live like this and see how things are evolving. I know things will change very fastly uh, going forward, but. Uh, I hope all the best to, to the country and to the upcoming decisions there. Uh, thank you, Joao. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Joao. We are always available here to discuss these topics. Mm -hmm.